This is the start of a fall sabbatical sem um, semester for me, which is really exciting to take a little time out from my normal teaching. I teach um, just outside of Boston at Wellesley College and have a, a, um, the parents of one of my alums here, which is very exciting. Um, and it's just, I wanna say from the start, to begin um, this kind of a um, research project here in this community is really special. This is really such an amazing place. And I've heard about it a lot before. I had a chance to take a short workshop here right before the pandemic. It was about the, the one thing that I did um, uh, uh, here in this country during a last sabbatical right before the pandemic started. It was the electro etch workshop. Um, and so I knew it was a really special place, but I didn't know that much about the community. And I've been just so impressed with the, the week and a half or so that I've been here. Kimberly's been so welcoming. Tony's been fantastic. Chris is just filled with all kinds of great information and stories. Liz is amazing in all the different kinds of support. Um, Jackie's been so welcoming. So it's really, and all the interns have been so alert and alive and engaged. So I know these things don't happen just on their own. It really takes a lot of effort to kind of build a community and sustain it over time. So I think you're really lucky to be part of this. Um, and I feel really lucky to be here and using that dreamy little cottage um, to be able to focus in a way that is actually really difficult to do when you're alone in your studio, in your regular home. You know, like um, this is a different kind of focus in the way. So um, I'm going to show you a few images because the project that I'm working on is a little bit new for me in the way that I'm going about it. And so I have a lot of questions. I don't have a lot finished, um, but I thought I would show you a little bit of the background of this project so that you get a, a feeling for what it's about, um, what I'm kind of grappling with. And then um, after looking at some slides together, we'll go over to the cottage for anyone who wants to stay on and have a conversation and we can build out the, the um, questions and and ideas and discussion from there. So just a couple images to start. Um, I'm showing you a work that's actually a very um, old work for me, but it was a pivotal one. Um, this, this is a handmade book. I have it over in the cottage for anyone who wants to take a look at it. I did it as an edition of 40. It's a lithograph and letterpress book called Victory Over the Sun, based on the Cubo Futurist um, uh, opera that was written in like 19, um, 1905, and Elizitsky did a series of lithos based on it in 1913. Um, but I used just uh, one, uh, uh, one scene of the opera um, that was translated into English as the basis for the imagery and the ideas in it. And I was looking a lot in special collections at images of sundials and different ways of thinking about time and capturing the sun. So my source material you know, gave me structures to kind of play with in different ways. And I was really thinking about the metaphors of that story. Um, I also brought along a book with me. Um, also, not long after that, I collaborated with Barbara Tettenbaum, who's based at Reed College now in, um, in um, Oregon. And um, this is a Leporello, Leporello book that reaches out, I don't know, maybe about six feet or so. It's a very small book, five inches high. And it started with a list of important events that every learned person should know. So we took the list and we put a, um, the event on every single page, and then we illustrated it with images that had already been printed in some other kind of form. And they were all Xerox transfers onto the stone, kind of manipulated. Um, and basically the tension between the images selected and the, the text and the story that was there, that was really kind of the gist of the book. So again, it was a found text in this case um, and found images and a dialogue between Barb and I as we developed this book. Um, I probably should have brought this book with me as well because it's a pretty pivotal one. This one, 40 Days, did not begin with any intention for it to be a book. It was just simply, I felt like I was so over-programmed at the time that every time I went into my studio, I had a million things on my to-do list. So I just started to draw a knot every day for you know just an hour or so. I'd sit down and just always with the light coming in from the left, I'd knot up a piece of fabric and just draw it. And after a while, I had so many, and I started to see that maybe there was something about a kind of meditative kind of quality that went um, into these knots. So this is a digital book. I've, I've done digital scans of graphite drawings, and it's just simply an index of all of these knots. But during the pandemic, when I was teaching out of my studio and um, remotely and surrounded by so much old work, 
I got thinking more about these knots and I started to realize that maybe there was more to the knots than I had really paid attention to at the time. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later as we go through, but this was actually a chance for me to think again about why was it that I was drawing a knot? It wasn't simply something interesting to draw. It started, I started to realize there were memories associated with seeing knots and that's where this project has actually kind of come from. So oddly enough, it also starts with this. This is a postcard from the Wisconsin School for Girls, which is just outside Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it was over the hill from where I grew up on a farm. Um, it was, this is a postcard found on eBay of this um, bucolic campus that was built. The, the stone cottages are very much like uh, the, um, the women's dorms, the nicer women's dorms at UW-Madison. Actually doesn't look all that different in these images from a place like Walsley College. It's sort of meant to be a, you know, a place to, to move between the, the, you know, these uh, natural environments going in and out of the buildings. Um, but it is a reform school. It's not actually aiming for um, elite um, um, uh, students who are trying to push themselves to be their very best. It's actually there for, for kids who have dropped through the system, right? Specifically girls. And um, growing up next door, um, it was, we rarely saw it, um, but it was, it was known to be there. My parents moved out to that area um, in the 50s. It turns out that it had been built in 1932 um, sat empty for a decade while um, the, the state was actually um, not um, paying anything more to kind of finish the facility. So they actually had a derelict facility in Milwaukee housing um, girls in the in Wisconsin Industrial School for Girls. And then in 1941, they actually moved, um, I think, 94 girls um, to the school, which on, it was a 405-acre farm. Um, and it was meant at that point to be a complete change, a, a progressive idea about how to help girls that were um, down on their luck. So right away, this was um, built on the cottage system. This is in, um, in the Wisconsin um, Architectural Registry. Um, the Wisconsin Historical Society has the blueprints, which I spent quite a bit of time with in May. And um, so these, um, these stone cottages were built. There were to be up to about 20 or 25 girls per cottage, and there were 10 cottages. Um, and so there were no locks on the doors. Um, it was meant to help girls actually begin to socialize and kind of find other ways to kind of solve their problems. It was very progressive in all the materials that as you read the reports from the different superintendents and the different people working there, their goals were super progressive. And it was in stark contrast to what had been happening at the, the uh, when the school was in Milwaukee. They were in such um, difficult circumstances. They locked the girls in. They painted over the windows so they could not see out as they worked in the kitchen. Um, they were not to stand more than two feet in front of a window in case they would be seen. I mean, it's just heartbreaking to read these stories, uh, which are all in the State Historical Society um, materials. So when you're um, on the site of the Wisconsin School for Girls, which does not exist anymore, um, this is the, as I remember it, the, um, the driveway to it, a long driveway that you would see from one, um, one road. What's there now, you see on the um, right-hand side is simply a, a pillar kind of indicating from 1941 to 1976, the, the school operated there. In about um, 1973, they began to accept boys into the school, boys and girls. Um, and then there weren't enough kids at that point. Um, actually, you know, there was foster care and a lot of changes happening. So at that point, they actually um, took the children who were in those situations um, really far north in Wisconsin. And they're in a facility now that heartbreakingly, there are many stories in, the, in NPR and, and the papers now about um, the kids being locked up in COVID. They're still locked up. They're in isolation. It's, it's, it's like watching this overall kind of arc go, go back around again. And they're talking about a new building, this time back in Milwaukee. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty heartbreaking kind of pendulum of convenience and, and conscience is um, the name of one book that's um, not been written about them specifically about, but about the way that we treat um, kids who have fallen, fallen through the system in different ways. So as a child driving by this, there was always a little bit of a worry or fear going past this particular driveway, even though 
um, as you, if you went down the driveway, and just recently I did with my oldest sister, she drove straight down and right up to it. Um, uh, but um, before I get to that, I'll say, whoops, I'm going to go back for a moment, just to give you a little Google view, a view I never saw in my own life. Didn't really quite even realize how close it was. What we see here on the pink dot, this is actually the farm that I grew up on, a long driveway, can't really see the, the farm from the road because this is a very hilly um, portion of Southern Wisconsin. This is a, a this, this um, the moraine is up a little higher. Um, and this is where the school is over here. And so the roads actually are coming in from two different directions. So it wasn't even really that clear to me how close it was when I was a child except that the girls ran away a lot. So here we see um, the road that I showed you. From here, you see this long, long driveway. It comes down, goes around. Eventually, um, this area here was developed into, a, this is the prison farm for men um, who are about to be released. Um, they were working there, but the girls' school, you went all the way down and back and in, and this is where the cottages were built. There's the family farm right here, and here's the 40 acres of the state farm between us. Um, and, um, and then here's a little portrait of my brother who continues to farm the land. You can see his, um, he um, farms in strips right in through here. So there's a, I had never really seen it from the air in quite this way, but I can definitely see his, his hard work over many years um, evident in that land. So another thing, as I started to look around, I found on Facebook, that someone um, had posted in the Oregon Historical Photos kind of Facebook group. So um, someone posted a few images of the girls' school and immediately all kinds of people started to weigh in. They were saying things like, my mother worked there and you know, I, re I remember this and the girls often came to our farm or like there were many um, notes that were um, written right away. So I was interested in all of these comments and these comments are something that I'm working with now trying to figure out how do I use these voices? Because there's the story of the girls, but there's also the story of a community that just sort of absorbs this activity um, and gets used to this activity being nearby, doesn't really know what it's about, but has ideas about it, projects ideas about it. Um, there's something about that space of um, being near this. We see this all over the country. We have more people in detention in this country than any other country, right? All of these communities live around these places in different ways. And you know, no one quite sees it coming, what is actually occurring, what are our responsibilities. Um, in this case, as you read through the comments on the post, people talk quite a bit about um, the runaways. Um, also, they talk about, oh, well, they only ran away because it was the best place to live and they wanted to be sent back. And I found that really curious. So this is part of what got me into the so the archives wanting to read deeper and realizing I didn't understand what was going on over there, what their goals were. And as I read deeper, I realized I knew a lot of people associated with the place, or I knew the names of people, you know. So with the affordance of distance, I live in Boston, and it's my brothers and sisters say, like, why are you even thinking about this place, you know? But it's there's something about it as a, I think, a bigger pattern that we see in our in our culture that I think is important to kind of understand a little bit more. I should also say that in this post, it's really typical. People start talking about the girls and very quickly they start talking about the men because um, over time, oh, it, so I should just say, here's a piece over that I've been experimenting with um, this week. The, um, a few comments from the neighbors are here, um, coming in, kind of dropping into the book. And um, a note that I found um, from a girl um, confessing to having stolen something when she was taken off the grounds and she feels it's the worst thing ever. So she has begun to um, exhibit signs of having a strong conscience. She's clearly a shoplifter and she confesses to the music teacher about her um, terrible crime. So these voices, trying to reconcile them is something I'm interested in. How do we do that graphically? Is there a way that making art can, can speak to these different, uh, different moments in time? But I would say that the neighbors commenting about the school, people have memories or their parents or grandparents worked at the school, but some of them worked the transition because this is what the school looks like right now. Here's this building, here it is again. But if you drive up all the way up, which I did in May with my oldest sister, it's a uh, minimum security prison. And in fact, if you look at the records, it probably should be a medium security prison 
It has a 6,000 square foot sun fence all the way around it. So even though it's on the architectural register, it's like you're not going in for a tour. Although my, my brother did go in for, one of my brothers went in for a tour and all he would say was, quite the place. It was something. <laughs> Can you give me more detail? <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is what you really see by the road now. We, um, the Oregon, the Oak Hill Correctional Institution for Men. Um, because this is a, you know, it's a well-built facility, you know, after the girls um, were sent north, um, you know, it was expensive to maintain. And so they, they um, transitioned um, into more prisons. And this is what we can see from our side, like deeper in the woods. There's a break in the woods and we can see in from this side. We also see this suddenly all over our property, which was interesting because we never put up no trespassing signs when they were coming over so much. But um, there is there is a yeah, there are changes that occur, of course. So when I thought about runaways, I think that as a child, I really thought about Nancy Sir. Sinatra and these boots are made for walking. <laughs> Actually, when I think about that driveway, the song just comes into my head as a small child being with um, my, my um, sister Francie, um, I think pulling into the driveway during a rainstorm and, um, and hearing that on the radio, just a strong kind of memory that kind of forms certain kinds of things. But as I think about what to do now with imagery and how to evoke some of the different aspects of, um, of this material, I, you know, looking at the ref, how do we reference, I don't think it's my, my um, place to be um, uh, telling the story of specific girls, certainly in the historical society, um, the records of individual girls um, for the last, uh, you know, for a long period of time, I can't see any of those specific records, um, but I do know some names um, and I have seen some materials within the general materials that I want to be uh, mindful of. Um, but it is also a matter of, it's not my story to tell of what it was actually like to be a girl there. But I do think that the neighborhood um, and some of these different forces I can speak to as an artist. But this is one of the questions that kind of is driving me as, a, as an artist right now. It's been really interesting to read into some of the memos about um, what to do, the policies on runaways. And what I've learned is that they had quite a few policies that they were reworking at different points but they did let the girls run away. Um, there, were, there was a, a, a um, bell that would ring if they left the building, or if they opened their doors, it was, they weren't locked. Um, but it's clear that the girls that I saw, the only girls I ever personally saw um, were two girls that came to our house um, asking to use a telephone because they said that their boyfriends, they'd had a fight with their boyfriends and they needed to call a taxi to get back to Madison. And so my mother let them in, they, they called the taxi, the taxi came and picked them up, and then my mother immediately called the school, which is what all the helpful citizens in the neighborhood did. You um, called and then they picked them up. So it turns out that if they get back bet between 9.30 p.m. and midnight of the day on which they ran, they might be placed in the security cottage or they might go back into their cottage. The idea was that to let them run away and then and then see the results of their, of their um, uh, um, impulsive action and see if there was, you know, help them kind of build um, kind of self-control. So it, they didn't stop them from running. They ran as far as I think Chicago or further sometimes. Um, but they also camped out in their barn. They also one time tried to steal the car, um, got stuck in the mud, left a footprint in the mud, which is also an image that is, has been um, on my mind a lot. But many other neighbors have similar stories of the story of we need to call a taxi um, to get. And then I found there was in the Wisconsin State Journal from the, the 50s, there were many, um, many articles that the school seems to have you know, cultivated um, with um, John Newhouse. Newhouse was a um, state um, journal staff writer. And he does many um, stories where he's actually interviewing the girls and they talk very candidly about um, running away um, get, going by the tracks, kind of waiting, and then realizing they were bored. They didn't obviously have a phone. They didn't have a compass. They didn't have a map. Um, so sometimes they would, would just go back. Right? Um, but sometimes they go further afield. And so the, um, the newspaper clippings are fascinating. And in the Fitchburg um, State Historical Society, or Fitchburg um, Library, they have a Fitchburg Room, um, which is the, the town that, that this um, um, space is in now. Um, 
they have a, a, a large clipping uh, a booklet. Somebody took all the clippings about the girls' school from the end of, um, early 1900s all the way through the end of the school. And it's a conservator's nightmare. They're all just starting to kind of yellow and fall apart. But these are, you know, I photographed every single one I could, and then I've been putting them back together um, uh, and trying to, to read um, the materials. And that's been really fascinating. And it feels to me like now I have maybe more than one artist book on my hands as well. Um, as for those of you who choose to come over to the cottage and take a look at some of the uh, things I'm working with, I also am kind of looking back to some previous images I've I've had in my studio or worked with in different ways. And um, I have a whole series of images of women at the door picking a lock and getting in. And I thought I knew what that was about. Now I think it's about something else. So this is actually this image in particular I'm using as the cover, I think, for uh, um, the larger the book that I'm, I'm hoping to um, complete. Um, certainly some of these newspaper clippings um, kind of play up kind of salacious kind of aspects here. The group of um, girls were taken off um, off site and um, um, to go swimming and a whole group of them tried to run away during it. So you can see these blurry photos in the newspaper about this. and. There's quite a bit of description of them being saucy and um, they saunter, you know, saucy and saunter comes up a lot in the description, sassy, you know. Um, but then there are other books um, in the records that are really interesting, having to do with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Some of the Dean of Women students there are, um, are doing quite a, quite a bit of reflection on like, this is a much more progressive way to run a, a campus. Um, and what these girls can learn. So this is this wise and natural booklet um, goes into great depth and has photos that I have been um, looking at much more carefully about like what their um, what their goals are and how they are kind of describing what the, the the school's goals are. A big question for me, and I guess another reason that this became um, an important topic for me to take on right now is thinking about how it's 1973 that it is no longer. They no longer have as many girls at the school. Um, and then they begin to take boys as well for a little while, and then they transition out. But 1973, of course, is um, Roe versus Wade. So when I think about it, it never occurred to me until recently, but how many of the girls there were pregnant? Right? So, and this in this book, there is like reference, like near, like the, um, for example, Jane was pregnant because the father of the child was, was, to, was unrevealed and there was no understanding for a place of, for an unwed girl like Jane in her small home community. So then suddenly the county judge sends her here. So that's been a question about how many of the girls were actually there because of um, being pregnant. It wasn't exclusively that. This isn't the story of, of the Irish um, laundries, but there is there are some parallels that are worth looking into. And then there is this idea of like, how does the school project its, its goals and um, how does the school help delinquent girls become kind of acculturated. So there are lots of clippings of, the, of this nature where the assemblyman, Robert Lynch, and um, then the Senator Lewis Prang, they're there um, for a party that the girls all set up. They do a fair and they perform and they, they go on the road singing. They do quite a bit of outreach saying like, we are, you know, we're getting our act together. But along the way, of course, there is this graphic moment that um, really interests me. I've only seen this in some of the clippings, but it was enough to, to give me a, a way into some of the material. These are others. So there's a, a tumbling performance that's happening and there's a chorus. And then there's this person right here. She's very, just on the edge of the picture, but she's become a person that I'm quite interested in, Julia Landmark, who was the music um, and choir director. She also took drawing courses, taught some art courses, the art, a lot of her records are actually in the State Historical Society, and she seems to have been just an extraordinary educator, someone who had like this amazing kind of connection to the girls and who brought out something in them in this, this really kind of extraordinary kind of way. Um, so here you can see some of my first moves, like playing with this idea of the sensors, the, the blackout um, happening, um, working back from some of the knots and the... Um, the um, architectural renderings. Um, this um, scene of the girls in the volleyball court is actually from the Wise and Natural um, kind of booklet. This is where I'm unsure. Is it, should I be using this material? Should I not? This is where I'm, I don't know if this will be published in the end, but I'll just share it with you now since we're in in progress kind of um, discussion. 
Um, I also found that on Julia Landmark, girls would slip notes to her and they're in the in the file and they're really sometimes heartbreaking. There's the, the shoplifter who confesses about lying, about um, um, s stealing a 60 cent jar of salve from the choir room. Um, and there's a girl who says, you dig me. I realize you know who I am. I, I have this feeling about music and you understand me. And so it, it's this, this um, little one, it's folded up this big. It was clearly in a pocket, you know, and it's just an amazing um, kind of testament to what that experience is. So a few other people I just want to mention because I think maybe every kind of archival research of this type would open this up in different ways, but I didn't know these things. For example, Miss Harriet Grimm um, who has also become a person of great um, interest to me. Um, you can see she's holding a paper that says, imitation is the surest flattery, which is kind of great to know as a printmaker. Um, she is a suffragette. She, um, the University of, of Chicago graduate, she travels all through the Midwest, kind of stumping for the vote. There's some great photos. Sometimes um, some of the older men listening to her speak have their heads in their hands like so. Um, it probably was a pretty hard crowd, but she was known for a great oration. And so um, she turns out by the 20s, um, she is teaching, she has an MA in speech. I found a, a book by her on Amazon on practical um, voice training. She wrote her PhD on Susan B. Anthony, and in her practical voice training, some of the exercises are Susan B. Anthony's um, um, uh, writing. So it's really, it's quite wonderful. Um, but the reason she's pivotal is that soon after her work as a suffragette, she was on the Wisconsin Board of Control, which was had to do with um, prison reform. She's very active in prison reform. And she is the reason that the school moved to this rural environment. She actually oversaw the planning of the, of the dormitories and, and um, the blueprints and the furnishings. So she was the person who actually kind of made it a more pro progressive place physically. It was her, her efforts. And so, you know, on Wikipedia, they talk about her suffragette work and say, and very little else is known about her. But actually, there's quite a bit more about her. She's pretty fascinating. Another key person was um, Dr. Hania Reese, um, who I, I never met, but I certainly knew some of the Reeses in that family. She was the medical director at the Wisconsin School for Girls. She has an enormous file in the Wisconsin Historical Society, really um, pivotal and interesting figure. And in her work as medical director, she started to realize just like how um, sexually transmitted diseases, but especially unwanted pre pregnancies, what, what the actual toll of that was. So she says in a student population between 160 and 260, we have at times 30 to uh, 10 to 30 pregnant girls ranging in age from 13 to 19, some in their second and third pregnancy. I honestly did not know until I went through these records that Wisconsin was the last state in the U.S. to have contraception legal from unmarried girls, unmarried women. 1969. So that does explain some things, right? Um, she also was a pretty big advocate for nuclear disarmament. She did, a, you know, she was really a very, very active um, activist um, um, figure in, in Wisconsin. She's fascinating. Um, another person who has become really interesting to me is Thomas Tooney, who was the, um, the superintendent from 1959 to 1964. Um, he was, he was very progressive in many ways. His reports are really fascinating. Um, and there's, yeah, in the clippings booklet, he is um, picketing um, Wallace, who's come through um, Wisconsin um, in 1964 um, speaking. So he, he's interesting. It, it's interesting to see how um, ideas about the civil rights um, movement are affecting kind of this particular um, kind of story and those who are working with girls from many parts of Wisconsin. For the most part, um, most of the girls um, are white in this population. Um, there's a higher than, than should be population of students um, at the school who are black, higher than the percentage in Wisconsin itself. Um, I wondered if there would be many um, Native American girls, but the numbers were like a handful. There were other schools, I think, that, that were probably, um, would be well worth looking into in terms of what, that, what the experience was for um, uh, Native American girls in Wisconsin um, in this way. In the beginning, in, in Milwaukee, girls could be sent to that school simply for being poor. You know, they didn't have to have had any 
any offense whatsoever. Just being poor was enough to to land you there. But after a while, they be it was more like having some kind of a of maybe running away or being uncontrollable with your family or truancy, um, you know, or you know um, other movements. So Thomas Tooney's his um, annual reports are actually really fascinating because they talk quite a bit about um, what they're trying to do, kind of philosophically with the girls. And he um, sometimes he has the girls pose like this is actually a student. This is probably one of the few ones who actually is posing for the the um, the report itself. And then he enlists uh, some of the student artists to um, to decorate the covers. Um, not the greatest drawing, but what's really interesting to me is the telephone is the center of everything, right? Um, in that way. And of course, it it speaks to this time. Current students wouldn't even know what that is, right? Or it's a image from it's an icon from long ago, right? So um, I'm going to be finishing this now, but um, over in the, st in the studio, I have laid out what I've got. I've, I've brought in a couple books. You can see here's the, um, the chronology of important events kind of laid out for you to look at. But um, since I've been here, I've been um, layering some of the materials that I've got, um, starting to see how images are speaking to one another. And it's turned out that um, working with um, the blueprints has actually been an interesting way to kind of proceed. I, don't, I didn't expect that when I got here. Um, a week ago, um, um, Sunday, I didn't expect to be doing blueprints at all, but it's been really interesting to, I think the immediacy is kind of what I need at this particular stage before I get into a deeper kind of additioning. But um, you can see some of the different um, images that I'm working with and, um, and some of it's simply a matter of trying out different papers and feeling what is the right kind of size format, all of that together is a factor. Um, so I'd be happy to take questions there and I guess, for any of you who might be just finishing here, I'll say of some of the um, related readings, if you're someone who's interested in ideas about memoir or working with real life in relationship to one's work, I came across this book, Artful Truths, recently. This is actually by a colleague who teaches in philosophy at Wellesley. I only learned about it this spring. It's a fantastic book about these questions of like, how do we know that our truths, how do we, how do we make art out of our truths? knowing that others are going to experience it in other ways. So she speaks about that. She's a beautiful writer, just a fantastic writer. And she does creative writing, but she's also a philosopher. Um, and she's talking about the philosophical uh, kind of dynamics of, of that particular um, kind of feature. So if um, this is a general topic of interest to you, I highly recommend that book. And I think that's all I have here right now. I hope I haven't gone too long. Anybody have any quick question they'd like to ask here before we take a walk over? What was the alternative to the girls there? What could have happened to them? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, sometimes it was a court who sent them. Um, and in the early days in Milwaukee, sometimes families, this, and this also I noticed from um, Daughters of the State by Barbara Benzel. She's also a Wellesley uh, colleague, um, died a number of years back, but she um, was the head of the education department there. She writes about Massachusetts as it was pretty common that families who had so many kids to feed would sometimes send the girl to the state school. Um, and that was, so there's a parallel there. This is also a really interesting book, Bad Girls at Samarkand. This is talking about this in the South. This is in South Carolina. There, the girls actually burned the school down. It's a really amazing. That's a quite a dramatic story. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's shocking, shocking what was going on there. I mean, yeah. So I didn't find those kinds of things in my research. But where, where girls would go, yeah. I do know that I can, without saying too much right now, I would say I do know someone who probably worked pretty hard that it would not be known that they were orphaned so that they wouldn't be sent to a place like the Milwaukee School for Girls. I do know someone personally who was in that circumstance. But in terms of girls who um, were pregnant, you know, without support, I don't know. Pardon? That's, that's another really good question. Yeah, I have a feeling more of that might be in Hannah Reese's uh, materials. There's references about um, uh, taking the girls to um, Madison General for, for procedures. Oddly enough, most of, the, most of the materials I was reading, there was a lot more detail about dental health. Dental was a really big thing. Yeah, they were talking about like how, 
just the sheer amount of dental work, because most of the girls had had no medical or, or dental kind of help at all before they got there. So that was a big factor. Like, they can't learn if their teeth are hurting. I doubt it. There, I, good question. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's definitely more. But it's interesting how so much of the material is all about Oak Hill, the men's prison now. So it's really, I'm realizing it's like a, you know, this few decades of a very particular thing happening. You know, it's, and those who were there is that when I do find a name, I'm realizing how many of them have just recently died. Certainly the people who work there, you know, have lived well into their 90s. And, you know, there's some record sometimes of what they were talking about. There was a, a 1986 um, reunion of people who worked at the school. Um, I, I thought the, I thought the scrapbook might have come from that, but no one knows actually who donated the scrapbook. You know, um, so that seems to maybe have been one individual who worked at the place a long, long time. Whereas others, not so much. But yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah. Did you go to UW? I did. Oh, yay! I was actually there when some of the people left. I was there in '67. Yeah. So I, I did, you, did you ever hear about the Wisconsin no, School for Girls? Never. Yeah. Uh, and I, I didn't know that birth control wasn't allowed until '69 yeah. because it, it was plenty of it on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and they, yeah. we saw that one of the pictures was a man from Sheboygan uh, framing, and I have a story associated with that. Yeah. yeah. That's a funny thing. You start going in these materials, and the names are just kind of reverberating in yeah. some really interesting ways. You know? yeah. yeah, Madison, the UW Madison has a lot to do with the school. They sent a lot of social work graduate students there back and forth. So I feel like probably I should start gathering up those names of the Facebook comments because there are some some um, uh, who might want to tell me more. Like I've I've done some kind of short interviews with people that I know were extended neighbors and whatnot, but I haven't really um, called up a lot of other people. So, yeah. But it is for me new to kind of work with this level of specifics in my work, you know, so trying to figure out what is the way to approach this, like what's the ethical way to approach it. Um, it feels like it's material that, you know, has been kind of lurking in the back of other work that I've done without realizing that like, the questions like that, even if, if not the specifics, just the, the feeling, the tone feeling of, you know, wondering about stories, about reading between the lines, you know, which is there's so many things about what we do in printmaking where we, we look at the opposites and we, we mirror things and we project things and we, you know, work with shadows, you know, all of these things are sort of part of the, of the story of making print. And it relates conceptually to all kinds of things too. So it's both method and it's it's concept both. Yeah. Are there any concerns about the direction that the final product is Um I think it's I think it's too soon for me to have a clear sense about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think I, I went as soon as I settled into the archives this past May, I realized there were many more complicated stories than I had initially thought, and that my my first my first impulse I didn't want to hang on to it too tightly. You know, it seemed important to stay open to these other questions. Um, so I feel like there is a little part of me that wants to go after the story of some of these really strong and interesting individuals. If not anything. Just for their names, Miss Harriet Grimm. How great is that, <laughs> right? And Miss Ethel Brubacher. You know, like they're they're fantastic names, and they and they were really interesting women who who did, you know, were really civically engaged and and um, you know are kind of unknown in many respects for for how much they did and contributed, right? Um, so there's a little piece of that that's interesting to me. There's also like this bigger arc, this worry, you know. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who's been feeling, you know, great pain at all the stories of you know, children in detention, you know, and borders, everything. So we see these patterns in our society and you think like, it doesn't just happen now. It's got like all these reverberations as well. So I don't have an answer for those things, but I think it's important to let our, let our art sort of, you know, engage with the world in that way. But yeah, I don't have a, 
I don't have a specific mission yet. I'm not sure I will, but I, I, I do feel like I've got to start to narrow a little bit more. Good question. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Any other questions? Some of your projects in the morning are just tremendous collaborations with the faculty members. And in the last, the, the 40 days, it was organic. You could have um, had it almost directly to the beginning of the project. So you weren't just coming out of one, one letter in the other, or you would have moments where something could be sort of quickly adapted, and these ones could, could come mm -hmm. from. I think there's often this tension between um, the programmatic and the intuition, the intuitive and the programmatic, and they can inform each other. Actually, I forgot to, to finish the story about the knots, didn't I? <laughs> because the girls came, they asked to use the telephone, they went in, but what was left behind in the wastebasket were all of these sheets that, that were tied up in knots. That was the image. So they must have like let themselves out of the room um, by um, nodding up their sheets, and that's how they were not heard as they left the building. <laughs> right. So there's something about the knots, I think, in that particular way. So sometimes I I really believe strongly in um, what we see in our peripheral vision is incredibly important, and um, but it doesn't it, you can't focus on it because it's your periphery and it's part of your intuition. Like when you travel and you're jet lag, you're still seeing things and taking in the feeling of a place and noticing things that you won't notice later once you know the place. So I feel like those are all things that are accessible to a person who makes art. It's just trying to figure out how to develop it, listen to it, build it out in some kind of way. So and this is, your question really gets to the heart of, um, you know, here I am after all these years of teaching in the liberal arts context, but there is something about trusting a part that can't be explained and not being verbally not knowledgeable about what one is doing at the time. It's really important, I think, for art to kind of leave space for that not knowing and to, um, to let the process of working with images show you something that you didn't consciously expect for yourself. So I think I have learned to trust that a lot more um, over time. Good question. Many more things to be said about that, I think. Anything else anyone would like to voice while we're here before we take a walk over? Yeah. 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 That will be interesting. Yeah. I think it's good to kind of close it off and open it up again. You know, so right now I feel so immersed in it, I'm not really sure where I'm at. So I um, definitely welcome your thoughts for any of you who'd like to come over to the to the cottage now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.